Love this podcast? Support this show through the Acast supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give, and there's no regular commitment. Just click the link in the show description to support now. All right, film geeks, today we're talking about Living, starring Bill Nye, who is not the science guy. Let's talk about it. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of All Right, Let's Talk About It. My name is Savannah. If you're brand new, I am your host. I do film reviews and film industry commentary. I am frustrated, y'all. I have had so many technical difficulties. So I have already recorded this part, but my computer just shut off in the middle of it. I'm like, are you kidding me? I had a good stride going. This laptop, it's a 2017 MacBook Air, and it does not hold a charge. It has to stay plugged in at all times, so it's not like I can take this thing to a Starbucks to do work or anything. Like, it has to stay on my desk. It cannot move at all. I think the charger is actually taped into the charge port on my laptop. Like, it cannot move. If I unplug the charger, the phone, the whole system shuts off. Doesn't hold a charge. Very frustrating. Frustrating. We need a new one. Um, so we're, we're just going to hope for the best and just get through this the best way we can while still being incredibly thorough. So we are talking about living a new film did come out this week. Uh, the new magic Mike film, I believe it's the third film in the franchise, but if I'm being honest, I'm just not really all that interested and I haven't seen the second one. So I don't think I could give you an honest opinion. No excuse. I have HBO max, both, both of the first and both the first and second film are on HBO max. And I've seen the first one, loved it as much as most, you know, red blooded women loved it. But I'm just not all that interested in seeing the second or the third. But I was able to go to the movies earlier this week and I did see Living, the 2022 film. It is Oscar nominated. It stars Bill Nye, Alex Sharp, Amy Lou Wood and Tom Burke. Directed by Oliver Hermanis. This is a remake of a 1952 film called, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, Aikiru, directed by Akira Kurosawa. Akira Kurosawa is a Japanese filmmaker. He passed away, uh, I believe, late 90s, and absolute legend, legendary. Um, if you study film in any capacity, if you ever take a film class and in your film class you watch films, nine out of 10, you are going to watch Rashomon. Rashomon is one of the greatest films of all time. Don't ask me what it's about. I was very confused while I was watching it, but yet was able to garner. This is incredible. The most foreign films are like that for me. Like it takes me a minute to really figure out what's going on because I'm very much distracted by the subtitles, the foreign language, and then just the fact that the style in and of itself is just very different from what I'm used to in American cinema. And also, and I was also 18 when I saw this film. It's the last time I saw it, but it's, a staple. If you're going to study film, you have to watch Rashomon. It's you have to. There's no getting away, getting around it. Now, you listening to this may have never heard of him, but the industry has heard of him. We're talking about industry people who are students of film, so they know who Akira Kurosawa is. They recognize the name as a household name. They've studied his work, um, have been inspired by him. And I, I think it was very bold of Mr. Hermanis to take on one of his works and remake it. Um, I have not seen the original, but I, I just think that was such a very bold and courageous choice on his part. Because again, this is someone industry people would be very familiar with. And this is a film that obviously he and the people behind him in the respective studios believe is a winner. This has been nominated for two Academy Awards, Best Actor for Bill Nye and Best Adapted Screenplay. So is it, does it live up to that hype? Is this worthy of an Oscar? So what is this even about? This is about a man named Rodney Williams. He is a bureaucrat. He works for the London County Council and the Public Works Department. He kind of leads a team. I think what I'm not sure what they would call him over there in the UK, but just the way it's set up, we would call him maybe a team lead. That's what it looked like. So he works in the Public Works Department. He has several people under him. And this has been his life for several years. He uh lives this humdrum mundane routine boring life and that's it 
But things change when he gets a terminal cancer diagnosis and he comes face to face with the monotony of his life, the mundaneness of it all, and realizing that he has a life, but he hasn't been living one. He hasn't been living at all. And now he has to figure out what to do. He's got six to nine months to live. He's very ill. And he has an option. He can go back to work and do the same thing he's been doing for however many years, or he can try to figure out how to live with the time that he has. And that's what this movie is about. This is about a man who's trying to figure out how to turn his life around in six to nine months, how to live, how to really live and enjoy life and not take it for granted, but also figure out what that looks like. He's he's an older man. He has a son and a daughter-in-law that he lives with. And his wife um, passed away. I believe through suicide, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly. And he's trying to figure out how to make the most of it. You know, does he just go out, have a good time, get drunk, do crazy things and just live life that way? He has a co-worker, one of the his subordinates named Mrs. Harris, whom he is quite fond of and who respects him greatly, and he is very interested in her zest and zeal for life and seeks to learn from her how to live life to the fullest, how to make the most of what time he has, and how to really invest in the people around him. He wants to understand not just the life that he's lived, but also get a good grasp of the time he has. This story is told from two perspectives. So we have it from Mr. Rodney Williams, played by Bill Nye, and then Mr. Peter Wakeling, played by Alex Sharp. This movie starts with uh, Mr. Wakeling because this is his, you know, it starts with his first day on the job. He's excited, new opportunity, and yet his introduction is, you know, the mundane boringness of it all. Just the routine. Everyone looks alike. There's no color. There's no real life. And now he's got this boss who is just seemingly disconnected from it all he's so used to the boringness of it all that he's just kind of disconnected until he gets this cancer diagnosis but they don't know about that he doesn't share it with anyone except for mrs harris so spoiler alert for that um he doesn't tell his son or daughter-in-law but he does confide in mrs harris and then a stranger that he meets in a diner that he's dying and he doesn't have much time left he doesn't have the luxury of time anymore. And now he's faced with the fact that the luxury of time, he's taken it for granted. And you have Mr. Peter Wakeling, who is kind of a witness to this boring mundaneness. So we're seeing the boring and mundane through his eyes and kind of seeing the misery of it all. So we're seeing a man who's kind of trying to, who wants to live life to the fullest, who wants to enjoy new opportunities, but now he's in a situation where everything is just routine and boring. And now we have a man who's lived routine and boring and wants to enjoy life in a way that he hasn't before. So it's a beautiful story. I think Bill Nye gives such an incredible performance. Um, A very transformative performance. This is just something I've noticed. So I am... One movie away from seeing all of the best actor nominees. I still need to see After Sun. Um, forget the man's name. Peter Pascal, I think is his name, is nominated for best actor from that film. So I haven't seen that yet. Waiting for it to come to either a theater or some kind of streaming service somewhere. And But what I'm noticing from a lot of these best actor nominees is they all seem to have performances in which they transform you have austin butler who just completely transforms to a transform to a point where his voice is probably not going to go back to normal for a while you have brendan frazier who completely transforms into this obese 300 pound man you have colin farrell who just steps out of himself and becomes this new person and now you have bill nye who it's a very theatrical and just trans performance it was just beautiful he the this kind of reminded me a little bit of tar and i've said about tar that the movie tar is kate blanchett's performance that is the movie she carries it 
not metaphorically speaking, but everything in that movie hinges on her performance. If she fails, the entire movie fails. This, I think, is a little similar to that because Bill Nye's character's mood drives the story. This movie starts off boring and dull, but intentionally so. It's not a boring, dry dull in an amateurish sort of way it's very intentional it's on purpose we want to feel kind of the boring routineness of this so that we can really connect to what's going on in the story and then it picks up a little bit and it gets a little awkward because things with our main character are a little awkward and then it blossoms into something beautiful and as far as it's being an adapted, you know, adapted screenplay because we have Bill Nye, the actor who's nominated, and then the screenplay is nominated. This was beautifully written. Um, I'm a little disappointed that there isn't a cinematography acknowledgement of some kind. I thought this was beautifully shot and I love the lighting in this. So I think majority, if not the entire cast is white. This is set in London, however many decades ago. Um, in the early part of Queen Elizabeth's reign, somewhere around there, um, that's the only really peak of time that we get. If you're not familiar with London fashion or anything like that, the one peak of time that we get is this old picture of uh, Elizabeth the first. I'm sorry, Elizabeth the second, not Elizabeth the first. So that's it. So some, however many decades ago, that's the only peak of time that we get, including, you know, the fashion, the bowler hats and whatnot. But in terms of the writing, I thought this was beautifully written. Um, the dialogue I thought was so sweet and so sharp and intelligent. Uh, it, it was just beautifully shot. Again, that's where I was going. So majority of this cast is white and fine. That's wonderful. I don't care. But the way it, it would, the, the whoever did the lighting for this really catered to their faces and their complexion. It was very important that we see all these little minute details on their face. Like you could count their eyelashes. You could really see the blue in their eyes. It just stood out on screen. And I thought that was very symbolic because this is about these tiny little details in life that we just miss and we don't pay attention to. So I, that's something I noticed very early on in that we get a lot of these close-ups where we're paying a lot of attention to their eyes and these features, these little small things, the wrinkles, the the color and shade of their faces. Um, the angles were very old school and we had a lot of very high angles where we're looking down and where we have this empathetic feeling of what these people are going through. I just thought it was beautifully done. We get a lot of lack of color in the beginning. There's no, almost no color. It's very black and white and a lot of gray. And then all of a sudden we get a little bit of color as things picks up, picks up as Mr. Williams figures out what it means to live life to the fullest in the six to nine months that he has. But this is a beautiful message heavy film. And I kind of want to talk about that a little bit. So I said this movie is message heavy. Now, whenever I say message heavy, that could be a positive or negative. Um, in a negative way, when I say message heavy, I mean that it pushes a message at the expense of the quality of the film. So a phrase I say a lot, you know, message heavy, quality light, something to that extent. And I'm usually talking about a Christian film. A lot of Christian movies are like that in that in that they're all about the whole purpose of the movie is to push a message at the expense of everything else. So poor acting, poor direction, poor writing. Um, poor everything else, but solid message. Makes sense? And then you have it in a very positive way. And I think that's where living kind of sits. It's heavy message, but not at the expense of the quality of the film. So while we have a very profound message that really punches, we still have great acting, great writing, great direction, great cinematography, great pacing, great character development, Nothing, it doesn't fail. This movie is a winner in all aspects. And movies where they're really packing a heavy punch, they're trying to speak, they have a voice and they want to be heard. I, I always worry a little bit because 
I want to make, I want a quality and experience. I want a quality, quality, entertaining film. And sometimes when movies are trying to push a message where the direction is super heavy handed, everything else falls apart or something essential falls apart because it's almost like we can't do two things at once. We can either, either give you a sermon or we can give you a story. We cannot do both. This movie is both a story and a sermon. So what is this movie about? I, I talked about this a little bit before and that this is about life and not just having a life but living one living life to the fullest there are a couple of messages being pushed here number one i think is time is short there's never enough time our lives are but a grain of sand in the beach of eternity you know we're but a speck of dust time is short There's no time to be wasted here. And you have this old man who's been living this boring, mundane life for so long is now faced with his mortality. He has six to nine months left. And he's not just looking back on the life he's lived with a little bit of regret, but he's also looking forward to a very short future. He realizes, you know what? I have time. I can live my life to the absolute fullest. So that's one message this film is trying to send is time is short. I think another message this film is trying to send is don't waste time. I think I think that kind of falls in line. And I think that speaks to me a lot because as I, I don't think I mentioned in this one. I can't even remember. Again, I tried to record this and my computer just crapped out on me. But something that I've been struggling with, and I think a lot of women struggle with this because time is short for us in two ways. We have both your regular life clock, you know, where you have your 70 to 90 year life expectancy. But then as women, we also have our biological clock, you know, the closing window of our fertility. And it's very much felt. We don't talk about it a lot. Um, But you have a lot of women in there, especially now, because women are not having children the way they used to. You have more women now at the age of 30 who are childless than ever before. And there's this big push for women to be childless as long as possible until you have your life figured out, not realizing the mental health implications of that kind of decision. We don't talk enough about how heavy fertility weighs on the female mind. When you get to people like me who are at my age where we're not married, we're childless, it's something you think. It's something you think about quite a bit, especially if you at some point have wanted to be married and wanted to be a mother. It weighs. It's very heavy. And when you get to my age of 35 and you realize, you know what, I have maybe five or 10 years left to get this thing done to become a mother. Because while I probably will still keep having my monthly cycle until about the age of 50, because that's about the age for my family, um, in terms of being able to carry a child to f- full term, I don't have a lot of time. I am running out of time. And I am at a point now where I'm looking back on my life at all the time that I've wasted. And I think this sends a message to a lot of this could be a quality message to a lot of young people is that time is short and make the most of the time that you have. Don't waste your time doing something that's not for you. Live for you. What kind of life do you want to live? And do it. You want to travel the world? Get it done. You want to build your own business? Do it. If you do want that nine to five life and that's what you're looking forward to, there's nothing wrong with that either. But life is too short to waste it. There's not enough time. There are not enough days. There are not enough minutes. And I think this movie really speaks to that. But another message that this film sends, and I think this is the biggest message, and it really packs us heavy at the very end, is that you matter, your influence matters, that even when you feel like you're doing the ordinary mundane things, you're just doing what you normally do every single day, you make an impact. We see this in two different ways. We see this with Mrs. Harris, whom he's very fond of. He really wants her zest and zeal for life. And he, you know, basically says, you know, I just want to know how you do it, how you live life the way that you live. And she's like, I'm just ordinary. I'm just normal. Not realizing that her normal, ordinary, it might seem like nothing to her, but to him, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. And he wants it. That even in your normal or ordinary, whatever, your normal, ordinary day that you take for granted, somebody is looking at you like, I want what they have. How do I be like, how can I be like them? So we see that in Mrs. Harris, where he is just admiring her zest and zeal for life and just wants a taste of it. And then 
spoiler alert here, but he does die at the end. And we're seeing the legacy that he was able to leave in the amount of time that he had. And he did it in such a beautiful way because this movie really starts off with these ladies wanting to build a park in kind of a vacant lot in the area where they live and them getting passed around from, you know, department to department to department, which um, I don't want to, I hate using the word triggered, but it kind of like struck a nerve because it just reminded me of being on the phone with customer service and being bounced from department to department to department to department to department. And I thought that was such a relatable thing to watch and see and like, Times really haven't changed all that much, but we have these ladies who are trying to build this park for the children in their area, and they keep getting passed around, and nothing's getting done, but at the very end, he decides, you know what, I want to do this. I want to build this park, so he gets it done almost single-handedly. Um, he pushes for things to get done. He goes to all these departments who have all these different jobs, you know, people who can help clean it up, people who can fund it, people who can, you know, get the equipment and who can give the final stamp of approval. He single-handedly gets this done, but he doesn't do it alone. He makes sure that wherever he goes, he has a witness. And these are the guys that work under him. He makes sure that they see everything that he does. Because he, know, he knows his time is short, but they don't know that. They have no idea. And they're very confused as to why he's pushing this simple thing so hard. This, this little playground in this vacant lot, which is barely big enough to hold a swing set and a slide. Why this is so important. Why this matters. He wants to make sure that when he's gone, they remember how much he pushed to do something for someone else. Their job is so boring and so mundane. They're used to pushing papers. They're used to, you know, just pushing things to the side and saying, oh, we'll keep this file here. And he decided, no, if it's important to someone, it has to be important for us. And when we go about doing these important things for other people, we have to give it everything that we have. And it wasn't just enough for him to just do this on his own. And then they see the results, but they got to be a witness to the process. So leaving behind a legacy wasn't just, you know, leaving behind a park and some fun memories, but was leaving behind these real life life lessons for these men. And then the challenge of having to live up to that example. That was this movie. This movie was so quick and short. It ended damn near before it started. It moved beautifully. But so much focus was on using the voice that this director had to to push this message. And he was able to say what he needed to say in a beautiful quality way. I think this is a very timely movie. I think this is a movie that everyone should see. So if this is in your area, take the time to go watch it. So many movies right now that are Oscar nominated are being re-released to theaters. Even some movies that, um, are that came out months ago and are not Oscar nominated. They might be SAG nominated like till, um, has been re-released to some AMC theaters. So if this is in your area, I highly recommend catching it before it goes. But beautifully done. I loved it so much. Thank you so much for listening. Once again, that is Living, starring Bill Nye. I think it is worthy of his two Oscar nods, Best Actor and Best Adapted Screenplay. Beautiful, message-heavy film, well-directed, beautifully shot. God, I love the lighting in this movie. So if you're able to catch it before it leaves theaters, do so. Now, what is coming up? So this month is so weird. It's a month of February, and if you're not aware, I live in the city of New Orleans. So what is February in New Orleans? Mardi Gras. I'm actually going to a parade tonight, tomorrow, and then I think Sunday. (laughs) Um, And then next week, things really pick up Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Tuesday is Mardi Gras day. So a lot of you are like, oh, wait, why do you have parades? All day? For those who didn't know, and I didn't know this before I moved here, but Mardi Gras is not just a day. It's a season. It starts January 6th, which is King's Day or Epiphany, Three Kings Day, um, and goes until Mardi Gras Day, which is the day before Lent. And then, you know, Lent starts, you know, 40 days of uh, fasting something. This is a very Catholic city. So that's why. Yes, a lot of people are probably very confused with all the debauchery and craziness that New Orleans is associated with. This city is incredibly Catholic with a very rich Catholic history. So 
King's Day, Mardi Gras, Lent, big deal here. And it's all month long. So you have parades starting in January and going up until Mardi Gras Day. And then right after that, we go into St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day is a huge deal here. The Irish and and it's also Italian um, heritage as well. So it kind of all rings together. You have the Irish American Parade. And then I know St. Joseph's Day. I don't know much about that, but I do know um, the Italian American Parade is that day. I love that parade. I think because there are a lot of good looking men in that parade and I don't get a whole lot of eye candy living here. So I take it where I can get it. So what does that mean for next week? Because I live in Uptown, which is a neighborhood in the New Orleans area, just west of the French Quarter, just north of St. Charles Avenue. And St. Charles Avenue is where all the Uptown. So if you ever download an app for the Mardi Gras parade schedule and it says Uptown, that means St. Charles Avenue. It starts blocks from my house and goes all the way downtown. So driving is just not happening. Um, That means going to the movies Thursday night is just not going to happen. Trying to go to church next weekend, just not going to happen. I know um, there's some kind of youth meeting that I'm supposed to go to. And I'm like, no, I'm not driving anywhere. I'm not leaving my house. I'm not giving up my parking spot. Uh, I have driveways on either side of my house that I can use if I wanted to, but I really don't want to because the way the city is designed, the front of your car will get torn up because the curb is way too high and not slanted properly. But that's a whole nother grievance. So uh, what are, what to expect next week? The movie Marlowe comes out. And I will be seeing that, I think, Tuesday, which I think is Valentine's Day. So you will get a review for that probably either Wednesday or Friday. Um, The movie Emily is being released to theaters. That is a 2022 film that is getting a wide release starting next week. I have bought Wuthering Wuthering, the Heights book that Emily Bronte wrote. I, I bought the book so I can finally read it because this movie is going to be about the inspiration behind that novel. And her life. And so I wanted to kind of read what were the, what the, the Heights book before I saw the movie, just so I could kind of understand what was going on. And also because I, I, it makes no sense as to why I haven't even read it yet. That's that's shameful. So Marlowe review coming out next week. We're gonna also get, you're also going to get a Black History Month episode next week. I cannot wait to do that one. I'm really excited. Um, and then probably Emily coming out the week after. Jesus Revolution actually comes out, I think, the week after as well. And I am looking forward to see that one. If I'm not mistaken, I need to look that one up. I believe that is kind of the story behind Passion City Church. I think. I think. I need to look it up. And yeah, I am actually going to put out a list on my Instagram so that you guys can see what movies I will I'm planning on seeing in the month the rest of February and also in the month of March. So for you, if you are wanting me to review a movie and it's not on that list, that might require a little something more on your part. Why am I mentioning this? Um, because it's actually happened on my TikTok because everybody and their mama was wanting me to do a review for Wakanda forever. And I'm like, yeah, I have no interest in seeing this. I'm not a big MCU fan. While I have enjoyed the movies that I have seen from MCU, um, I'm just not interested in seeing Wakanda forever. And I told people, I said, if you want me to see, it, you're gonna have to Venmo me money for a ticket. This is how much it costs. 30 bucks. That's ticket and a movie. That's ticket, popcorn and a drink. That's it. And people came through. They Venmo me money. And I did a review and I'm like, I feel like this is fair. So that's the deal. That's the deal. If you want me to do a review on something that's in theaters, but it's not on my list of movies that I'm going to see, my Venmo's in the description. That's the deal. That's that's it. Um, because everything, all of this comes out of pocket. But I just want to keep y'all kind of in the loop on what my plans are in terms of film reviews, especially as we get into the heavy spring and summer season, because winter is almost done. Insane. Oh my goodness. But... I hope you enjoyed today's review. And if you're in the city of New Orleans, stay safe. Uh, Don't pay for parking. That's stupid. Don't do that. Just street park somewhere and hope for the best. I mean, someone's probably going to break in your car. There's no denying it. My car's been broken into twice. Anyways, have a lovely weekend and I will see you next week.
Want to advertise on this podcast? Check the episode description to see how you can be featured on the next episode.